Hi and welcome. Often as genuine as the media's attempts might be to capture the human moment of a tragedy or a disaster like a fire, frankly they can't. More often than not, their reports can capture the hows, the whens, the wheres, the whats, even the whys. But the whos, the really personal angle, that's a little harder. So with this in mind, earlier this year, we here at the ABC gave video cameras to some of the victims of those devastating fires here in the national capital last January. Fires that destroyed more than 500 homes and left many more Canberrans hapless and homeless. We invited them to film the aftermath of that terrible firestorm to record the impact on their lives as well as their efforts to get things back together again. Well, what you're about to share is the result. A rare piece, you could say, of real reality television. I won't say enjoy it, but the people both in front and behind the camera and their soul-searching experiences, I guarantee, will leave their mark. The fires in 2002 and 2003 were the worst fires I have ever seen in my life. My dad fought the fires. My dad is the fire captain of Namati. He tried to save our house. It was just surreal, just surreal. You know, this shouldn't be happening here. The, the paddocks were dust. There shouldn't be these fires here. Um, so I got Brett up. He said, we have to get you out of here. Brett got out of his car and I just said, please don't go back. He said he has had to come back and look after the house. When I looked out of the office window early in the afternoon, I could see the flames sparkling in the distance, mostly just smoke billowing out and the wind picking up terribly. Then uh, helicopters started coming over very close and then the sky started getting very dark and finally got to pitch black. The winds got stronger and then started to come in all directions at once and it was like being in the middle of a maelstrom. The most horrifying sight was just the amount of fire falling out of the sky. We're not talking about burning leaves here, we're talking about burning branches. And they were dropping from every direction and wherever they hit the ground, a fire would spring up. It was just unbelievable. I didn't know what was happening. We were told about two minutes before that we had to get out and the flames appeared over the ridge and I just grabbed the cat. I was in a pair of shorts, a pair of shoes and nothing else. Luckily, I turned the car around and was facing out into the, into the driveway, out into the street, otherwise I would never have got out. So I looked out the, uh, the kitchen window and the vehicle was just... Uh, what happened to the house was then the, uh, the kitchen window blew. Uh, once the kitchen window blew in, the oxygen that was inside the house basically was just feeding the fire. It was just like a hungry monster coming to feed on the uh, on the insides of the house there. That's when I thought, well, it's time to, uh, to get out. It was like waves, like a waves of sparks and black, really black smoke and sparks. see anything. All the traffic lights were out, the electricity was out, it was dark like night. And, and a policewoman stopped us at the bottom of Renmark Street and said, you can't go further, you're not allowed up here. Um, I said, well, my husband's up there, I know he's up there, he's on his own. 
And she said, just no. You know, there were about three of them, and they just said, no, no, turn, go back, go back. Turn around and go back. We got uh, onto Canberra's outskirts, basically, as the uh, the firestorm was hitting the outer suburbs of Duffy. My strong recollection is um, his daughter and I sort of holding hands, running up the driveway in this holocaust of wind and heat and noise, and, and we're just talking to each other and encouraging each other as we ran, basically, for our lives, that um, it was worth leaving the house, it was worth taking the risk, we are going to lose it because um, ultimately the most important thing was that, uh, that Dorte and I survived it and, uh, and we're still together. At one stage I said to Bridget, I think my house is gone. And she said, I think it has too. And I didn't say it, but I thought Brett was dead. I don't know how anything survived. I just couldn't see how anything survived. And I couldn't, couldn't get through to him. I tried the mobile a couple of times. I was just frantic. I was trying not to be, I think. I might have seemed calm, but I was so scared. The sounds and the groans and as the sheets of iron were flying off, and the, the barbecue as the gas exploded, um, and you just hear these noises and sort of, it was like it was, you know, like it was dying. No idea that this was going to happen. It was like, it was like a bad dream. <laughs> it was just like a bad dream. Well, I feel like the past is finished on the 18th of January. You know, all the letters from your parents and things, you know. Lots of things that you... Uh, they wouldn't mean anything to anyone else. Except, you know, my daughter and, yeah. 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 The next day, when the smoke had cleared, it, it was like a war zone. The heat was suffocating. There were four dead, more than 400 injured, and there were over 1,500 people left homeless. We had no power, we had no phone, and in the national parks, where this had all begun days earlier, well, they were left just like burnt matchsticks. skating, ice skating. I was a skating champion, Australian champion, way back in 1950. Uh, I turned professional and then won the World Professional Championship in 1953. And that started my life of skating, on the road, more or less. I spent the next 40 years living out of a suitcase, so to speak. So when I got to, to Canberra and I was offered the job to coach, I thought, ah, oh, this is it. I'm going to have my home and I'll put down my roots. Well, this was home. This was kind of, all right, now I can put my feet up, I can relax. I've been working hard all day. And that's what, this was it. I can just unload, you know? This was my little kingdom. Well, this is it, this is the kingdom. And how quickly it all changes. Here is my studio. This was the last thing, my dream, I've always had, I wanted to have a studio because I'm dabbling in art and uh, more than dabbling, I've become, I was thinking of making it a bit of a career after skating. I'm totally up to the studio and do this, so you can get that a little bit more. You see what I've got down, yeah? All right, one more time. I'm a town planner in Canberra. Um, 
works usually really, really flat out. It's even more so now. I guess um, I've got a little bit of an insight as to what some of our clients are experiencing, because as you can see, there's not a great deal left of our house either. This used to be our home. Uh, that's looking through to the garage and through what used to be a dining living area. Yep, a hell of a mess. Bloody ivy. It would have been all right if it burnt up, but uh, pretty tough. People around the place who stayed with their houses were trying to, to put the house out, um, but they couldn't, so within a couple of hours it was burnt down. I guess we've met neighbours we didn't didn't ever meet before. That's, that's one good thing. And again, they say that sometimes the best neighbours are the ones you don't see much of either. Each time I come back into this area, I still can't believe it happened. And I just can't believe that the destruction and the fact that there's so little left of, of people's possessions and memories over the years and years. So here we are. And now at Eildon Place, number 10. The remains of my camper van. I can't believe this was ever a house. And I look at it, it's sort of incredible. It's, I just can't believe that we actually lived there. <laughs> because it's, it's so destroyed. There's almost nothing recognisable. <laughs> Well, that was a five bedroom, two bathroom, and ensuite house. It's quite a lot of rubbish now. <laughs> this was a house that I'd built from scratch. Uh, I'd helped design. I'd got the land as a block of land. I was one of the perhaps two original residents uh, of Eildon Place. I thought to myself, if I lost this house and all the possessions, um, how could I survive all that? Not good at all. No. The thing about our place, in terms of the park, was it was a very unusual house. So it wasn't your normal sort of park ranger type of house. It had full length windows. It was a uh, four bedroom, uh, two bathroom, um, sort of ponderosa, if you like, a very large sort of rambling house. What's left there, Doll? They used to sit right on top of the cupboard. All the um, wine we brought back from Chile. Oh, it's got water in it, too, look. You can have a drink out of that. You better not. But it was an idyllic lifestyle, and that's the thing. And literally two minutes away from work, the kids uh, down at school at Farwa, you know, part of the rural community. Yeah, why uh, did we get that rain? To find ourselves now having to uh, live in town, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit tough. Yeah. If we had that rain then, we might have, uh, we might still have had a house. No. Oh, yeah. mm. uh, this morning, just trying to make myself look half decent. For a 37-year-old, I feel about 107. <laughs> so. Not really sure how we're feeling at the moment with Fox. The kids as well, they just got lost. <laughs> lost, lost at Kingston. Lost, lost at Kingston Apartments. Goodness knows how they got lost. I just got a phone call. They never got lost in the bush, but they can't seem to make their way around the garden. Everyone's feeling a little tense this morning. They're not doing too well. Why are you worried? We want Spot back. Why? We want to hug Spot. Spot got saved from the fire. Well, today I've decided to really write the board and make the plans of my new house. If I don't get them done, 
it'll just be probably next year before I get into it. Hopefully it's all really, really work out. Hi, mate. Oh, hi, Marin. Oh, you can do, grab a cup of tea, huh? Yeah, I can have one. Do you like one? Uh, no, I don't think so. I won't have one now because I just want to finish this tonight. Have a look at this. Come over here and see what you think. These are the plans now that I've been working on all night. Even though you're in somebody else's house who is absolutely wonderful to you, you're looked after, they're very supportive. Um, I decided to go back to work straight away because I think this was the best thing. Work always has been my... Uh, whenever in times when anything happened, when my mother died, when things like that, I was at work the next day. Some people mightn't understand that, but I feel... Uh, that's my way of coping with all of these things. I've gone through a lot of things in life and I thought that this is going to beat me. It's a bit old to start again, but on the other hand, what do you do? You give up and I don't intend to give up. Ice skating, and any sport for that matter, or anything, and determinations the one great thing you have to have. Yeah. And if you don't have that, you just don't make it. So you can get that because at the end, you need all that power. Yeah? So you've got to pace it so that you get to that, and then you pull that, get that power in there, and really sock it away at the end. Like you did the last break. Yeah. That was just great. There are a few people that sort of say, oh, well, are you getting the, are you over it yet, you know? Like, and you go, no. <laughs> or, you know, oh, were you insured? And you say, uh, yeah, and they go, oh, that's, that's all right, you're fine. And it's so, like, uh, well, I'd rather have my old garbage than new stuff bought by insurance. So we're probably looking for something smaller than that. Well, sure. and deeper. OK. The home is not the building. The home is all the things in it, oh. and it's all the things in it that we lost. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we lost the house too, and we loved the house. And we will rebuild the house, but we won't. We can't rebuild the home. It's going to take time. That's the hard bit. You, you can't. It's not. You can't go shopping for a home. And so you go. Shit happens. It's gone and I'm not going to dwell on it because it's too painful. I'm not going to go to that place that only hurts. I just want a sort of bit of therapy, actually. Yeah. <laughs> what are they, uh, wishing stones? I wish we still had a house. <laughs> For me, it's, you look at this stuff, you sort of think, well, this is all we've got left. There's nothing else that we've got left besides the photographs and a few things like that that Michelle say, but sort of stuff from the house, um, a lot of people sort of saying, look, it's just, you know, it's all burned, or everybody just you know, get rid of it. But it's a fine line between sort of things that you know will out, sort of almost become family mementos, because they'll tell a story about what happened, uh, you know, the 18th of January 2003 versus it's just junk. And looking at it now, you probably think, yeah, most of it's junk. But, you know, when Jordan's my age and he's, you know, he's got kids and he'll talk about, you know, what happened at a place called Timberville Nature Reserve, to sort of have something say, well, this is what survived the fire. Um, it's probably, uh, yeah, sort of for history's sake, I guess, you know, to sort of have a, a few uh, mementos that become, uh, you know, a bit of keepsake. So, so, yeah, it's a fine line between, you know, what is trash and what is treasure, I suppose. You see, and this is all, all my glasses. So there's all the bases of them. And they've all just melted into a heap of <laughs> stuff. <laughs> In fact, that wheelbarrow, I had that as a kid. Um, that was my, uh, my father's wheelbarrow. Um, and mum gave it to us as she was leaving Canberra. And actually, that's probably the only thing left that I've got from sort of my childhood. One of the last things that I managed to save from the house, one of the only things I saved from the house, was our pet dog. And today, we had to make the decision to put her down. I'd already saved her from uh, being put down. She was uh, at the RSPCA. And uh, so she's, she's quite a survivor, but uh, she cannot survive the cancer.
we're going to be taking her to, to the vet. And she's to be put down here. When is it all going to end? That's right. We are now trying to work out where best to put the body. We didn't want it being burnt considering uh, what we've been through with fires. So we've decided now to take her out to the old house and find a spot there where we can uh, dig, dig a hole ready for her return from the vet. That's actually going to be quite hard work. They might dig her up again. We should go so there. we should go onto the right-hand corner, yeah. and the new house. We'll, 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 we'll look far. over. Yeah, we'll mm. look over her. It's hard. That's quite big. It does. Yep. I'm here in Fadden, come to visit my cat. Uh, a friend of mine, Louise, has take, kindly consented to take her in for the whole period of the time until I build my house and I can put her back in her house. She's got a lovely run here and they look after her very well. And I've got to say goodbye to her for a couple of weeks. She's part of my family, she, well, she is my family. And uh, we survived all that together, so I suppose that's what makes her extra special as well. And, uh, come on, come on then. Uh, and that's why I really do take the trouble, I think. Well, plus, I love her so much, you know. It's just, I, hard, one of the hardest things is saying to, I know it's stupid, but I, when they said, oh, it's gonna be nine months before you get a new house, and uh, at first they said six months, and, and then when I had to come here, just the thought of having to do this, for, have her here for nine months, even though she's, it's great, it's just really, really pretty hard. Come on, come on. Come on, sweetheart. Come on. Oh, yes, come on. I can't believe we have to fill in forms. <laughs> to get a dog put down. I didn't sign anything when I got the cat put down. <laughs> we learnt this from you, I think. Get an animal put down before, mm -hmm. so you know it's pretty quick once we give yeah, them a needle. I know. You know once we get that stuff in, she'll be asleep within 10 seconds probably after I've got it in there, which surprises some people, so it's better, you know, beforehand. Yeah. It's pretty foolproof stuff. You right there? Oh, Just, and look, she won't feel anything, just a jab with um. the needle, and um, but she might just stiffen up momentarily after I give it to her, so just. Just to steady her a little in case that's a, an exaggerated sort of a reaction as well. <laughs> we took her down to the coast just before Christmas, her last time down the coast, and she didn't go in the water this occasion, but I'd taken a lot of movies of her surfing. She'd learned how to surf. There's another dog down there that taught her how to do it, another Labrador. She knew when to break through the waves on the way out. And then she'd learnt to body surf the waves on the way in. And I had movies of all this, but uh, those movies disappeared in the fire, along with everything else.
Alright, puppy. It's the hardest thing I've ever had to do. I think the personal side of it has been pushed to the wayside for some people. Mm. It's now a matter of getting these blocks cleared and, and I think the way we feel about that particular house is, has almost been forgotten and especially the way the children relate to that house mm. has mm. been forgotten and now it's just, okay, now we've got this block of land back, mm. um, we have to do something with it. Here, Brett, you take this one. <laughs> <laughs> You ready? Right? Hang on, this is it. <laughs> we had a very, uh, a very strong connection with, uh, with Timpin Villa and, you know, the lifestyle that we had out there. And that's been difficult to come to grips with, that we just, we have lost that, that connection. There's a greater machine... Called bureaucracy. <laughs> ...pushing it along and, and even though there's structures still standing, there's some of our stuff in it that, um, I think Jordan especially still still feels a sense of ownership to that oh, to that place. Oh, he does. We all do, but yeah. um, Jordan and Gemma can't quite understand the there's bureaucracy of it all. And also, there's idea that it wasn't exactly ours to actually be able to sort of be in charge of the, our own destiny in terms of what will happen with the house at Timpin Villa. Um, I guess we're sort of coming to the realization that uh, you know we've got to sort of you know, move on. I guess. You get seven years of bad luck to break the glass, Billy. Just about there. Just about there. This should be terrific fun. A new home. Basically, we're in the process of moving in to the um, caretaker's residence in Commonwealth Park, which we've been very fortunate in getting hold of, and we've been madly buying furniture, stuff that hopefully will fit back into our new house, as well as here, temporarily. Um, so, yeah, we've just got a new lounge. It's all pretty bright. People have been fantastic. Nephew and his wife have given us a package of bits and pieces, ice cube trays, laundry basket and lots of other goodies and it all really, really helps out, that's for sure. If you can hear the music in the background, if, if that's what it is, um, there's a rave party uh, right next door um, at the stage in, in the park. So it's full of young people out there um, having a bit of a dance. Um, so it's, it's pretty noisy around here. Last time I'll see this old mailbox. And this is the last time I'll be walking through my gate. So the hardest thing is the garden because say goodbye to everything because this time tomorrow it'll be all gone and just have to press on with, with the new one now oh, I just knew it'd be hard but I didn't think it'd be this hard so goodbye house Well, it's four months after the fires and they're finally getting around to demolishing the ruins of our house and the hassles that are involved are incredible. No one was prepared for anything this big. It's been estimated to be equivalent to 23 Hiroshima bombs. And the response from the government, to my mind, has not been enough. 
Now, there have been people that have said that we've been generously compensated. In my case, uh, we received a $5,000 grant, and I'm quite thankful for that. But when you look at these kind of things, you've got a situation where the community appeal puts uh, money in one pocket and the government takes twice that amount out in taxes and uh, on the, uh, out of the other pocket. And as a result of this, people are starting to walk away from their blocks of land. And I'm one of those people who's been considering that. My wife and I have been looking at other houses and uh, have decided uh, that if we find one that's suitable, we probably won't rebuild because the expense uh, and the underinsurance just won't allow us to do that. That's our life they're putting in the back of a truck. I guess it's not easy. Um, obviously from the from the park's point of view, you know, we've got to sort of move on and uh, the place has got to get cleaned up and uh, a new house to be built and a new beginning. But I suppose for us it marks the uh, you know, the end of, uh, I guess, our time uh, here at Tipton Villa and more importantly in this, uh, this house. And the other incredible thing is it's, it's taken us four months to get to the stage where we've got these demolition contractors finally on site and cleaning these sites up. And it takes literally a day to clean up, but four months it's taken for us to get here. And uh, it'll be nice to sort of see it all cleaned up and not have to come back here and be reminded constantly of, of what happened on that horrible afternoon. And the next stage now is, is one of rebuilding. Not only you know, this house here at Temple Villa, but all the other houses that we lost in the park and uh, the buildings that we lost and the depots that we lost. So. Uh, Hopefully that won't take as long as what it has taken for the cleanup, but uh, I don't, uh, I don't live in too much hope. But... It was our miss, but now it's not ours. It was all a bit emotional and too much, and to be back out there on a dreary day. Um, watching a house being demolished that had burnt down in really dry weather <laughs> was a bit much for us, so we went straight to the travel agent and <laughs> and organised a trip away. Um, I just want to get away from all this burnt environment and the burnt mentality. Just everything we deal with here is burnt. I just want to get away. To hear the kids laugh and scream and giggle and, uh, and carry on uh, sort of a million miles away from Canberra and all the problems of, uh, that we've had in Canberra the last few months, it just seems like a, a lifetime away, so, uh, which is what this is all about. I thought, I thought all the emotions had coming and seeing it like this, but when, when I walked around the corner and I saw that, that big thing just lifting up a whole pile of stuff and thinking, that's your life they're lifting up, and, or your past life, and plonking in a truck and just going away to the tip. I, I thought I, had, I was over with all this. But I'm sorry, I'm not. And it's... You think there you were sitting and you were with friends in that load of rubble that's going, or there your mum sat in that chair, and or all you. No. That's all part of parcel of it, I suppose. No, it's not easy. saying where there's life, there's hope, but it's been a good thing to come over and just look at it, because that's kind of uh, really, it's reinforced me in saying that I'm going to come back here and rebuild. That's the one major thing, I think, decision that I've made today, without a doubt. Uh, there's going to be lots of hassles, that already there's hassles, but on the other hand, I know I'm going to do it. I guess the last eight days I felt pretty shattered. We've had a very 
busy month where I've been going through the papers, looking, running around at weekends, looking at, you know, eight or nine houses. Um, we've also talked to a few architects and I've been combing the net, looking at their work, getting addresses, going and looking at the houses as well. And from the outside, that is, of the architect designed ones. At $318,000, you see my instructions? Is there a further increase? A last opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, at $318,000... What spurred this sort of sudden furious activity was our immediate neighbour on our right put their block up for sale and we were pretty sort of upset about that. And then the other neighbour next to them decided to sell theirs as well at auction which we did find pretty upsetting and I actually then really started thinking hard about did I really want to go back and live there um, I sort of feel resentful <laughs> in advance about the people who might buy the blocks I sort of thinking well, I don't know if I like these people. They're taking advantage of, you know, they're coming in probably all happy because they've, you know, bought themselves a nice block and are going to build their glorious home on the backs of us all losing ours. <laughs> and it's illogical. They're probably going to be very nice people, but I don't even feel like getting to know them at this stage if that's if we decide to go back. Of course, the problem is now, I don't know. I'm even more uncertain because where we're living, where we lived, it's going to be so different. Keys. Good. Right. <laughs> All right. All right. That's just the letter for the cat. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, we'll put that through as soon as we can. The owner's already. Um, Okay, to... okay good. good. All right, we'll have you moving. Well, thank you very much. That's right, not a problem. Thanks a lot. Good. Today, to make it all complete, I've just got my cat, I've got Shatsy, and uh, we're going to go, I'm going to take her home, and we start off again. So it's quite a, quite a momentous day. I feel so... All the past few weeks have all gone away in a sudden, in a rush, and I'm starting off afresh, and I am quite excited about it. So, here we go. <laughs> after, after having had my own house and having it just how I wanted, this is, it's so hard just to go into something that isn't nice. And I thought, well, it's a whole year out of your life, and you just can't get in somewhere just for the sake of having somewhere to live and not living. I think a home has to be lived in. It doesn't matter how small or how big or whatever. It's the basic thing. You have to enjoy it and like it, and I'm, I'm sure I'm going to enjoy this. I'm really, I'm really thrilled to bits about all this. Plenty of space for... Oh, yes! <laughs> now that I have got it here, I, I, it was the right decision because uh, it's made me have something that I've got to be responsible for. Uh, it's more, it's more normalising in my life than living without her. Yes, you like your new home, don't you? Eh? I, I'm just happy that I've got her, and they can. <laughs> they, <laughs> that was <laughs> the reaction to the camera, I guess. But uh, I wouldn't be without her, and it's that's another part of my life back to normal. After six months, I felt like I was going quite insane. Um, I felt like I was sort of on the about 40, 45 per cent on the sanity and wellbeing scale. The stress wasn't just on us, um, the stress was in the community, um, our workplaces, um, and people were really quite cracking up and um, putting a lot of tension on each other. You wouldn't want something bigger there? What about just. Yeah, that's all right. I'm a terrible backseat driver. Um, and so I, I don't think I'm behaving any differently 
<laughs> but you're reacting. Yeah. It's sort of like, and then when you react, like you get really angry with me. I'm like, what's going on there? I mean, I haven't said anything different to what I normally do. Yeah, so it's definitely translating itself into, yeah, you feeling picked on when I'm, you know, don't mean to pick on you. Yeah, I know. Last night I went to get some counselling and you could see and think, shit, the boss has gone mad. <laughs> mad. <laughs> Gone to see a they probably noticed that yeah. anyway themselves. Um, there are a few issues at work where uh, I just felt normal under normal circumstances um, would have just been water off a duck's back, but it suddenly became a bigger issue, and uh, I was snappy and, as she put it, you know, feeling picked on. She then asked about the loss of the house, and I explained how our house had gone, but those directly either side and opposite and behind weren't and she said well you probably are feeling like you've been picked on because your house was picked out and um, so to some extent there's this feeling deep down that um, that we're unlucky and you know what the old why me syndrome it's a lot of rubble and crap down there i think that's the last of the bricks i hope so now There are cracks appearing in our family. I ended up having one and a half hours with the counsellor. I broke down at one stage when I was talking about my dog Poppy. It's very upsetting. My wife often said that I loved the dog more than I loved her. Out the gate. Our boy Christopher is disengaging a little from the things he normally does. He seems to be lonely. He's missing his dog terribly. He wears Poppy's dog tags around his neck on a piece of string. And when he's really upset, he goes to bed holding Poppy's collar. Um, if it wasn't so sad, it'd be very sweet. He knows that no dog can replace Poppy, but he's the sort of kid who really likes to have an animal. And he asked me on Thursday if he could go to the RSPCA and have a look. And there was this other dog there, and I could just see that he fell in love with this dog at first sight. bit of a change and I'll trade anything to have Poppy back but this is the next best thing. and I put the bird grass down the bottom and that's the money we raised. Because we thought it was a good idea to give some money to Daddy's work. He didn't want it for himself or to build him a house. He wanted the National Park to be fixed, I mm. suppose, you know, mm. seven-year-olds who... But um, what I found, he, he almost became obsessed with the, the drawing. He wouldn't talk about the fires at all. He found it very, very difficult to talk about the fires. And that was his way of communicating what he was feeling. Um, and I suppose a sense of doing something for him. Mm. But they started off being like single pages and um, over probably about a week to, to sort of 10 days, they became four or five fools caps, mm. sort of all stuck oh. together. I to go down there. <laughs> this is the biggest picture I drew. Would you like to get dressed in your journeys now? 
This is the bed that uh, has been donated to all the bushfire victims that have lost everything. Um, it's just great to have this and here again, all like all the other things that we've had donated and what people have done, it's just been overwhelming, all this support, and it makes you feel that you're not alone. Made by Wednesday Craft Group, Geraldton, Western Australia, February 2003, for a Canberra fire resident, and it's a quilted. It's a quilted. Isn't that lovely? I thought that'll be just beautiful over, over you know, over the, the lounge or something yes, like yes, this. Yeah, and it's from Geraldton. And it's beautifully done. Yes. And they supplied a whole lot for residents of the ACT from all over Australia. And it's really, really lovely. So I was just excited about that too. So everything's, it helps to ease the... I know sometimes I think, I know this is all great, and it is, it is great, but sometimes, or a lot of the time deep down, I still wish things were exactly as they were before the 18th of January. Because last night I was lying in bed and I, I was thinking about I don't have any photos of my grandmother and my great-grandmother and my father. And these are the things that no, nothing will replace. I mean, you've just got to keep it in your, in your memory. And sometimes it's hard as you get older, you, you forget these things and you have to look at something and, to bring it all back. When I first moved in, uh, the first couple of nights, or the first about two nights afterwards, I just sat down and I looked around and then I suddenly felt very bad because it was a home, it was my home, but it suddenly hit me that, yes, sure, I've got a house to live in, I should be very lucky, but it's still not my home. Well, I just want to get on with it, something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, okay, so still, I mean, uh, Oh, that's what the booklet yeah. I just wrote out of things. I'm sick of yeah. looking at houses for sale. <coughs> and are there any decent ones, or is it all sort of. Oh, well, you said. I suppose I, I found some. I, I found two that I thought would be great if, you know, if I was on my own. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. But the family wouldn't fit in. Yeah. <laughs> excited lately about some of the houses I've looked at that an architect has done. I found the old one very interesting and so I've been sort of talking to Rick about, you know, I've been sort of zeroing in on a particular person at the moment and, um, you know, on the good days I think positively about that. But I can still get quite choked up. Mm. We've thought a couple of times about whether we should sell. Um, economically, it might make sense to sell, but. I think we need something to focus on. Um, the other thing was, I think we made a conscious decision that um, we wanted to actually win out yes. of January 18, and the only way we're going to win is um, to build something to actually make our mark on that site. And um, nature made a mark on the site for us, which we didn't particularly like. Um, that's basically gone now, and we've got a, an empty site. And mm. um, we decided we want to um, stamp a bit of ourselves there and if we're there for a year or two years or five years or ten years, it doesn't matter. But out of January 18, we wanted to, to really establish a little bit of us in that part of the world. And I think it's a bit of, um, we're not going to let it beat us. <laughs> and, um, and we won't. How would you feel if we looked at it from the point of view that the studio, at some later date, could be utilised by another family as a family room? Well, yes, so I, well, I always thought of that. And so, I mean, this I've is got to be northern, quite honest now. I'm building the house for me, oh, yeah. and not for resale purposes. Yeah, no, I know that. And and I've got to live in the house, and I and I'm not 
going to have that many more years left. So, I, in a, some ways, I don't give a damn what happens when I die. Mm. People sometimes seem to forget what your actual wishes are. They're trying to make you want something that you don't really want. And I'm not, I've never done that in my life, and I'm not going to start and do it now. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's the way I feel about it. What do I got? She didn't say she's going to die. She said goodbye. Why? <laughs> goodbye, Michelle. This year, it's like, blow it. Everything I do, <laughs> every new thing I do that I used to be terrified of doing, I think, ugh. Oh, what have I got to lose, you know? I've lost quite a bit, so I don't think I'm gonna hurt myself by dropping from a great height. <laughs> um, but it was good, it's a great uh, year of challenges. I've set myself a heap of challenges for this year and I, I will fulfill those challenges. Um, I don't know what next year will bring, but this year I am pushing the boundaries. Someone pushed my boundary, so I'm going to push my own. <laughs> it was a good day. <laughs> Come on, buddy. Oh. 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 Go in the swing. Come on, have a go in the swing. Watch out. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Look out. Hey. As we go to air 11 months after the fires, young Jordan and his folks just can't wait to get back to their beloved national park. As for Dorte and Jeremy, Despite the ups and downs of a pretty hectic year, we get the impression that a fairly large phoenix could be rising out of their January ashes. Over that. Meanwhile, Rick and Melissa have finally hit on a new design, but the bureaucracy and the finances are still a bit of a worry. Reg, well, Reg's slab is being poured, but with or without his dream studio, he's just sold six of his fire paintings to a Sydney gallery. And Chartsy, Reg's cat, she's just purring. We're there. We're there. We've got through it. In just a moment, to look at Trial by Fire to be seen next week. And tomorrow, the Catalyst team update the big science stories of the year the Bioterror Detector disappearing sharks and the remains of an Aboriginal village in the series final of Catalyst tomorrow night at 8. But stay with us now for MDA.